Greetings, my name is Stefan Stevenson Bow, and today I'm going to be discussing how to detect attackers on your ICS network using your own measurements using a technique known as state estimation. A little bit about me. I have eight years experience more or less in InfoSec. I started off my career um, with a power utility. Um, it's a big one in the south. Um, I'm educated as a mechanical engineer, um, but I've taught myself uh, pretty much everything I know in InfoSec. Um, and I currently work as a penetration tester for Coal Fire Federal. Uh, a little bit of background on ICS attacks. Um, so attacks on critical infrastructure are a thing now, as I'm sure everyone is aware. Um, as control systems uh, continue to adapt more common technology that are used in IT, they open themselves up for all the vulnerabilities that normal IT systems are prone to. Um, the big difference is, is these systems are hooked up to massive machines and things that can kill people and cause major disruptions to society. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be defining um, attacks into two types. One, hard and fast, um, which we will not really be discussing. Think uh, DDoS, ransomware, things that are noisy, um, things that cause a lot of chaos suddenly and are very obvious. Um, instead, we're going to be talking about low and slow attacks. So think, you know, Trojan, backdoors, anything Stuxnet, anything where the attacker is trying to be stealthy and remain undetected. So traditional intrusion detection, you've got your IDSs, your firewall, your antivirus, um, DDoS mitigation, that sort of thing. Um, that Those are all uh, things that are used commonly in IT. Um, but most utilities, in my experience, uh, stop there pretty much. Uh, when it comes to a lot of these security products, um, their focus is on stopping them at the, the IT network before they can pivot onto the network, or just making it impossible to pivot onto the network um, by being disciplined about strict segmentation between the two networks so they can't get through. Um, the shortcomings with this uh, these products and this approach is that uh, it doesn't always work, as we all know. Um, it doesn't really embrace the defense in depth strategy. Most technologies, and the problem with most of these technologies is um, OT technologies like RTUs, PLCs, ladder logic controllers, um, they, you're not able to put a lot of these technologies um, onto these networks. Uh, one reason is because uh, they disrupt network performance um, and most, net, most engineers won't let you put them on there because they'll mess with things like reliability, latencies, uh, jitter on the network. Um, and even if you could put them on, regulators like NERC um, will often certify systems together as a unit. Um, and any kind of change like adding a IDS or changing an antivirus signature, signature um, could cause your uh, system to require being recertified. So, um, is there an answer to this? Like, is there, there really any uh, better way? Well, I think there is. And it's physics. So, the basic idea behind it is that uh, the laws of physics don't change. And neither do most ICS systems. They're pretty much static. They change very little over time. Um, power systems, you know, once they're set up, the actual physics behind how they work um, changes very little, and often the systems themselves change very little, so it gives you, as a security professional, the opportunity to look more at a whitelisting model, which I know many people cringe when they hear that, but in this case it's kind of appropriate because a lot of these systems are very static. Um, so state estimation you can think of as sort of a numerical whitelisting model. So a little bit of background on state estimation. Um, it was a technique developed in the power industry originally around the 1960s. Um, it was not developed uh, for security because no one was thinking about that back then, but instead is more of a way of ensuring reliability on the grid 
and preventing future blackouts by detecting garbage data more quickly. But for um, given certain circumstances, um, it gives us the chance to look at it as a, uh, as a security technique. Um, so the basic idea behind state estimation is you take raw, raw measurements from your sensors, you have a state estimator that you run it through that gives you state variables, which the state variables feed into your physics model, which is similar to the state estimator, to give you uh, measurements that you would have predicted. You then subtract those from the raw measurements that you got and you plug the output into a chi-squared um, distribution function, which will give you a probability that your measures, measurements are either garbage or being tampered with. So there's no way around it. This talk is very math heavy. Um, I had to learn everything about InfoSec on my own, so, you know, InfoSec people can learn some math now. My chance for revenge. In more mathematical terms, um, we basically have a bunch of measurements which we get by the vector z, and we are trying to find state variables x that we can describe those z's in terms of. Um, we, for this technique to work, because it is a numerical method, um, we need more z's than x's. Um, if the sizes are equal or less than, then this doesn't work because our system is either fully constrained or under constrained and we can't make a prediction on whether or not our data is good or bad. So, uh, to put that another way, we, we compute a system of functions h of x, which is a whole bunch of functions that are comprised of our state variables that give us our measurements. So, since this is, uh, we have more uh, measurements than we do variables, we have, you know, n plus m unknown, uh, equations, and m equations will have more um, equations than unknowns, which means that there are more than one solutions to this, which means this becomes an optimization problem. So, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to use the least squares method. There are other ways of solving this as an optimization problem, but least squares is the most accurate. So, our goal for least squares is to minimize j, which is nothing more than the sum of the squares of the differences between the expected measurement and the actual measurement. Um, oftentimes we'll put some kind of weight onto the measurements that's basically a description of how accurate it is. It is. It's given by 1 over sigma squared, and sigma being the standard deviation of the measurement. So the way we minimize j is the way we minimize anything else. By setting the um, derivative with respect to the state variables equal to 0. Now, because um, we're taking a derivative, we'll also need the derivative of h, um, or the Jacobian, since it's a, a matrix, which we do nothing more by just taking the partial derivatives with respect to each of our x variables. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire derivation because for the purposes of time, but essentially what you end up with is an iterative method where you have an initial value that you guess subtracted by uh, some delta and that gives you a next value, x1, which you then feed back into your x0 value to repeat the algorithm over and over again until your residuals end up being next to zero. So once you figure out j, <clears throat> once you figure out j, you then figure out the probability that um, the sum of the least squares um, accurately reflects uh, the data you're getting. And this you get by putting in p for zeta, your probability for zeta, and your degrees of freedom um, here. So obviously the more degrees of freedom, as you can see by this, um, the cleaner an answer you'll get. As you can see, where you only have one degree of freedom, this doesn't really tell you a whole lot right here. Whereas if you have 10, you get a much cleaner solution with your most likely case being either close to 0 or close to 1. Um, so you take 1 minus that probability, which will give you um, your likelihood that the measurements have been tampered with. So a result of 1 means that your measurements are perfect, and 0 means that there's no way those measurements can be accurate. 
Um, but obviously for this to work, we want uh, lots of accurate measurements with sta low standard deviations. <clears throat> uh, so some basics about power, because we're talking about this in the context of power, because it was invented for power systems. Um, we primarily work in phasers. We don't really work very much in the time domain because it makes the math a whole lot easier. Um, but otherwise, uh, you'd have to work with complex sines and cosines and stuff like that, which is really messy. Um, you can basically think of a phaser as a rotating vector that rotates uh, counterclockwise um, and has a offset and a magnitude, essentially, from other vectors. Um, so, as you can see, Drake says use phasers don't work in the time domain because it makes your math a whole lot easier rather than having to figure out uh, voltage drops across inductors and capacitors using a lot of complicated calculus. Um, so that does have consequences, though, uh, for our math. Uh, we can no longer use the simple equation power equals voltage times current. That does not work anymore. Instead, we have three concepts now. We have apparent power, real power, and imaginary power. Um, so your real power or your apparent power is your voltage times the complex conjugate of the current. Um, which is com broken into two components, your real power, which is what you think of when you think of electricity, and your imaginary power, which can kind of be thought of as um, power that is basically being bounced back into the grid because of things like uh, inductances and capacitances on your load. Uh, the Beer model is often used as a way of, of thinking about it, and optimizing this is a, a big part of being a transmission engineer. Um, so some basics on how the grid works. Um, power plant makes the power low voltage stepped up to high voltage, transmitted at high voltage to a transmission substation, to distribution substation, to small transformers on poles, to your house. Um, so a potential attack that we would worry about, you know, on a simplified grid like this is an attacker going after something like a numerical relay. So I'm not going to explain like oh, how an attacker would do that because we're all adults here and thinking about malware on, a, on something like a numerical relay running Windows CE is not something too far-fetched. Um, but essentially for the purposes of this, we're worried about an attacker who's very subtly trying to change a setting in either um, the potential transformer or the current transformer, which would give a bad voltage or current reading. This is... This could be bad because it could cause a relay to not break um, when the voltage conditions are dangerous, or it could cause it to break and cause disruptions when situations are not dangerous, neither of which is ideal. So we're going to see if we can use state estimation to detect this in a simple example. So this is about the simplest example I could come up with for state estimation. Um, normally, a real-life state estimation um, would be way more complicated than this. But for this we have a generator and a bus and two readings on one relay, uh, power, power, and then two reading, readings on the other one for real and reactive power and a voltage reading right here on a second bus and a transformer, sorry, transmission line in between the two. Um, for the purposes of making the math easier, we're going to assume that the power company is giving us uh, the voltage here, so we don't need a sensor, and um, that it's one, that it's that the voltage is one, and we know that for a hundred degree uh, certainty. This makes the math a bit easier. So we call this a virtual measurement, essentially. So we're we're not taking this measurement; it's just given to us. And these are the other measurements that our system is getting, and we want to know if these measurements are legitimate or if they've been hacked. So first, we need a set of equations to describe the physics behind the system. So we have our uh, first z, our, which is equal to our just the voltage. So that's h1 equals v2. It's pretty simple. Um, the others, we're taking the real part. So we have four power measurements, 
power one two, uh, real power one two, reactive, sorry, real power one two, reactive power one two, real power two one, reactive power two one, um, which is simply nothing more than the formula we took earlier with real and imaginary components taken respectively. So use, just by using Ohm's law, we can get the current. We don't need to measure it directly just by taking the differences between the two voltage phasors and multiplying by um, the impedance on the line. Through substitution, we get um, power 1 and 2, um, and then we take the real component of it to get the real power on the first, on the first line, and then the imaginary power on the, uh, sorry, bus 1. And then we can do the same thing to get uh, power on real and imaginary power on bus 2. Um, now that we have our equations um, and we know V1 for a certainty, um, we can cancel it out and that makes our equations form into this nice ma H matrix that looks like this. Um, and now we have all of our equations in two, un so we have now two unknowns and all our measurements in terms of that. Um, which are delta 2, which is the phasor offset um, between voltage 1 and voltage 2. We can just call, since um, delta is just a offset, we can just arbitrarily call one of them um, 0, which, again, makes our math easier. So we only have two state variables that we need to know as opposed to, one, as opposed to 3. So now for optimization. So as we recall earlier, our goal is to, to minimize J, which um, is simply the H values minus the Z values uh, squared and added together. So it expands out to this. Using substitution with uh, H that we just got, it expands out to this. Big, long, and nasty. Um, so then, using the equation that we have, or the algorithm that we came up with earlier for least squares, and using this weighted matrix, which is just nothing more than a whole bunch of weights in a diagonalized matrix, uh, to make the matrix multiplication easier, um, we get this for our H, uh, for our Jacobian, for, of our uh, H equations. We now run the algorithm, and the nice thing about the least squares algorithm is it's auto-correcting. So you can start with any guess, and it's going to lead you in the right direction. So we start with the initial guess of 0 for the angle and 1 for the voltage. We run it, and we get our uh, first iteration. We get this for x1 and this for our residuals. And um, while these residuals are low, uh, we can probably do better. It's always a good idea when you have a nonlinear system to run the equation at least twice. So we run it again, and we get this for our x value. Sorry, we use this as our input for our x's, and we run the equation, we run the algorithm again, and we get this for our second um, iteration for our x values, and this for our residuals. This looks a lot nicer. Um, so we then normalize these residuals by dividing by the standard deviation, and we get this. So then we, it's the sum of the squares, so we square all of our normalized residuals and get this. We add them all together, and we get J equals 20.76. So now we use that as input for our chi-squared matrix um, using 20.76 uh, 20 as our input for the zeta and our degrees of freedom um, as input for which line we should follow, and we get something that's up here. So, for the amount of degrees of freedom, that's a pretty clean, clean uh, answer that our data is definitely uh, being tampered with and somebody is messing with uh, one of the values that our relay is reading. Okay, well that's great, but now how do we discover who the culprit is? Um, well, it's actually pretty simple. Um, we can determine which sensor was bad simply by throwing out measurements um, and seeing if that lowers our J. Um, if it lowers our J, then it's likely that that measurement was the one that uh, was messing us up. But as you can see um, by this chart, when you throw out measurements, you lose degrees of freedom. So now instead of um, operating on the three line, we're operating on the two line, 
So if you don't have lots of redundant measurements, this isn't, uh, you won't get a clean answer often. Um, so using the previous example, we start with uh, measurements that we think might be um, bad, and there's really no way to do it than just guessing. So we start off with Z4, chuck that out, we get J equals 4.16, and uh, our new probability that we get is 12.5 by plugging it back into the uh, chi-squared equation. So it could be that one, kind of unlikely. Um, so then instead we try chucking out Z5, and we get 18.21 for J, um, which is corresponds to 0 0.01 from the chi-squared function. Um, so it's probably not that. Uh, so then instead we try Z2, and we get 1.626 for our J, um, which gives us a 44.34% probability that the estimations now make sense. Um, so as I said before, with two degrees of freedom, um, you often won't get a clean solution, but it's most likely that Z2 um, was the measurement that had been attacked or was being compromised since um, this raises up the probability so dramatically. So um, this tells us that the attacker was most likely uh, manipulating the reactive power reading on bus one. So with higher redundancy, again, and cleaner data, we get a more definitive measurement uh, answer on what the measurement is that is being attacked. So in summary, um, state estimation, you step one, create a mathematical model of the system you're trying to analyze the states of. Calculate the least squares estimates for the state you're trying to estimate based on um, the given measurements. Sum the squares to give you J. Calculate one minus the chi-squared test output, where V is your degrees of freedom, and look at the output and see if your measurements make sense. So uh, benefits of state estimation are, one, you're using measurements that you already have. That's probably the biggest one. So as far as defense and depth goes, this doesn't require um, doing any tricks to add, you know, normal commercial off-the-shelf um, IT security technology onto an OT system, which is a big plus. And if you work in the power system industry, you already have these. Um, ADD Spider, GE Load Flow, Siemens Spectrum. Um, there's lots of commercially available state estimators out there for the power industry that, again, were not designed for security, but could be potentially utilized for security. Um, it makes life much more difficult for an attacker to be stealthy. If an attacker is attacking your, your uh, sensors, they have to be, uh, especially if you have lots of re accurate redundant measurements, um, they need to be much more careful about how they manipulate those measurements to avoid detection. And um, a big one, too, is you can use it on legacy analog equipment um, by doing, you know, some digital conversion. But uh, legacy or analog equipment... Um, it's a technology that can be used on analog equipment. So uh, future work, because this isn't really something that's being used right now for security anywhere that I've seen, and if somebody knows better, please uh, correct me, um, is uh, what would be the best way to build a state estimator? Um, we have ones that are commercially available, but maybe it's a better idea to uh, integrate the data we already have into a data solution, um, you know, like Splunk or Elastic or some other sim, or maybe it's better to build it onto um, Splunk, like a Splunk app or an Elasticstack app or something like that. There's really no telling. Um, the techniques are, it's purely a numerical technique, um, so it could be deployed a numerous amount of ways. Um, there are lots of options, so it's an interesting, uh, be interesting to see what we discover. Um, can be used anywhere. Uh, it, because it's, again, it's a numerical technique, any system that's roughly stable and follows the laws of physics, um, you can use uh, state estimation as a technique for detecting an attacker. Um, it's, uh, it's an ICS uh, intrusion detection technique, not just useful uh, for power industry. Um, the only real limitations are that the system needs to be mostly static. Um, once things start changing over 10 hertz, there are there's research into uh, 
dynamic state estimation, um, but it's by no means uh, a well-established technique. So is state estimation a silver bullet? Uh, of course not. We're all adults here. We know that there are no silver bullets. So it does have drawbacks. Um, requires a uh, well-understood, documented physical model of the system. Uh, lots of redundant measurements. Um, and you're only able to determine if the data is actually garbage. So you're not actually able to determine if the data is malicious. Uh, again, this is why it works best in industrial environments where you you have knowledge that your sensors are of to a certain degree reliable um, because the manufacturer has told you that you have a mean time to failure or a certain standard deviation and it is what it says it is um, and not something else because you need to be able to trust that your sensors work um, to a certain degree before using this technique. Um, Additionally, uh, integrating state estimation into security is pretty much non-existent at this point. Um, most SOC teams have no idea how most of the systems, like as if they're defending physical systems, they often do not know the physics or how the, um, the actual physical system they're protecting works. Um, and even if they did, there aren't any SIMs that have any ability to build state estimation into them easily. Um, and the state estimators that do exist have no easy way of being integrated into uh, security products. So, of course, the answer is teamwork. Um, engineers that understand phys uh, state estimation and the physics behind what they're doing need to work with uh, the blue teamers, right? Um, teamwork and leadership is the answer that fixes this problem um, because often you'll have people that understand this stuff. They just need to to work together, and by working together, they'll make us all safer. So, special thanks to uh, Professor Sakis at uh, Georgia Tech. I used uh, some of his work in this presentation. And that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and I hope you learned a lot.